But what I would say is this, and, and this is maybe an, another thing that I've learned along the way, buying cheap isn't necessarily the guarantee of success. You know, you can buy stuff that's cheap that it's just gonna stay exactly as it is, no matter what. Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Mark Hamilton, co-founder of Hamilton Zants, a San Francisco-based real estate investment company with over $4.3 billion assets under management. I'm really pumped and excited to have him on the show today to share his incredible insight and background, but enough out of me, let's get him out here. G'day, Mark. Welcome to the show. How you doing so, mate? Good, Reed. Thank you for having me on and welcome to our shores. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, after interviewing over 300 uh, incredible entrepreneurs here in the United States, it's, uh, it's, it's been a bit of a journey, but really pumped to have you on the show and we'll get into your story in a little bit, but, but I ask all my guests who come on the, the show is rewind the clock and, and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. And so I'm just going to take a stab at it. It's probably mowing lawns. <laughs> um, you know, our, our parents gave us allowance based on chores that we did. And I probably, you know, mowing the lawn, probably put a few dollars in my pocket. Um, uh, you know, back in that day, yeah, we really did do lemonade stands and we were across the street from a, a community college. So a lot of community college kids came and went and bought lemonade at our lemonade stand, you know, from humble beginnings. Right. 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 And then and that's always a good you know introduction into the show because the show is about trying to tease out your story. And so, you know, you, you are quite well, uh, you have a huge, impressive portfolio and you've, you've built Hamilton's Dance from scratch. But for those people who don't know, uh, you know, your background, do you want to give us a little bit of a journey, trip down memory lane and how you got into, you know, the real estate industry originally, and then how you stumbled across wanting to start this company back in 2001? Well, so I, I, I will tell you, it was, uh, it happened completely by accident. I should thank my lucky stars because it was a pretty happy accident. Back in the day when I graduated from college uh, in 1981, um, I was quite certain that I was going uh, into a career as a, as, a, as a writer, as an academic, and probably as a college professor. Fate interceded and put me on a different path. I started out of college. I took a job at a commercial real estate firm just to put money away to go to graduate school. And I knew I was only going to do it for a year. And I just took the first job that came along. And it didn't matter what it was. I mean, I don't know that I was going to flip burgers, but uh, <laughs> it, you know, it, was an, it was an office job. And so I took it. And after a year, uh, I, set my, put, I put money away. I set my Fairly Wells. I got into graduate school and I went. And thank goodness it was a one-year program because if it had been a two-year program, I don't know that I would have stayed because it didn't suit me and I didn't suit it. But I, you know, I finished, I, I succeeded, I got my master's degree and then, and then that was that, right? That was going to be the end of that. And so I came back to San Francisco and, uh, and went back to the same firm, to, again, just to, have a, just to have a place to, to, to busy myself and make money. And at, at that time, the gal I would later marry she and I had decided because I hated graduate school. Um, and so we, she had decided that we, she and I had decided that we would get jobs teaching English in Japan so that we could, you know, put off worrying about careers in the future and the like. And then at the last, and, and we got jobs, but at the last minute she got cold feet. And so I was stuck in the same real estate firm again. And it just like, it never occurred to me. It never would have occurred to me. It's like that that's where my career was going to come from. It was a high pressure kind of boiler room, shark tank kind of place. Uh, there were a lot of good people there, but it just, it just wasn't for me. I didn't see myself being a, real, uh, a commercial real estate salesman. But one of the people that I worked with ended up, after my wife and I had bought our first place, we, we, we decided that we would look for something to renovate in San Francisco and you know, roll up our sleeves and work at night, work our day jobs and work at night and renovate, and renovate a place. And we, we bought a duplex that was kind of a wreck it was so bad, in fact, that it made my wife's mother cry when she first saw it. It was in a, something of a rough neighborhood at the time, but we liked it, right? It worked out. Clearly, it was going to be profitable. And, and my boss at the time at this commercial firm said, you know, can we make money doing that? And I said, yeah, of course we can make money doing it. He said, well, why don't you go out and find some more? Right. And so he gave me, he gave me the opportunity to basically moonlight while I was working for him. And he was the angel investor. My wife and I would go out and find the properties and, and handle the transactions. And my wife, who would later get her general contractor's license, uh, ended up doing all the renovation and property management. And it, and it just felt like it was hard work, right? And, and San Francisco was, 
was a charged environment even then, but we really liked it. And then uh, another married couple kind of did the same thing. They, they, and, and the four of us threw our lot in together to start this little business, you know, buying properties with investor capital and, and renovating them. And, and we were pretty good at it. So I did that off and on. I also worked as a broker uh, a bit to make ends meet when I needed to. But that, that basic model lasted for 16 years. Wow. Um, and it was very opportunistic. It was really based on San Francisco and then eventually Oakland. And then I met Tony Zanz in 2001. And he, his career was very different. He had, a, uh, he had an MBA from Wisconsin, which is the premier uh, real estate MBA. That had a corporate pedigree and resume that was, you know, exceptionally strong. And he just decided he was tired of the institutional world and, and trying to, to climb the corporate ladder. And we met through a friend and kind of ran side by side for a while. And finally, one day in the summer, he said, I want to be your partner. And I said, the worst thing that could happen to you is that I'd say, yes, why, why in the world would you want that? It's like you have this great career. You have a job that people would kill for. You don't want to do that anymore. He said, I'm tired of doing it. I'm tired of making everybody else's money for them. And I'm ready for a change. And I, I just said, look, there's no downside for me because I'm going to keep doing whatever, what, exactly what I'm doing. If this doesn't work out, I worry about you. But if you insist, then let's do it. And that's what we did. And so Hamilton Zans was formed in uh, 2001. Uh, it was Tony and I and, and, and one other person. And uh, I, had a, I had a portfolio of probably, you know, a small portfolio of maybe a dozen buildings at that point in time, uh, you know, a few hundred units. He had less than 100 units. He had two buildings. And we just threw our lot in together. And the first thing we bought in December of 2001 with 16 units. We bought a 16 unit apartment property. And then 2002 came along, we did a little more, 2003 did a little more and so on. And the, the engines kind of really ignited. And uh, eventually we decided to, to leave the Bay Area because uh, the prices here were just so breathtakingly high. And we really wanted to be able to distribute current returns. We didn't want to. We didn't want to follow a path of just assuming we would make money because it was San Francisco. We wanted to be to be able to validate that with uh, distributable income. And you know, one thing led to another, and now we're in. I'm going to tell you that we're in 28 markets in 15 states. And you know, we it, we never set out for it to be that way, but we're we're passionate about it. We're students of the game and. When we pick up a new market, we do it almost defensively because we're, you know, we're constantly being transactional and we have to have places to work. And some places, you know, some places, quite frankly, just get too expensive and we either sit on those or sell them. We'll, we'll, we'll do some of both. But we're always looking into new markets because, we, you know, we're always looking for those, the, that next wave of transactions that will pay cash flow. Right. Mate, such an incredible, where do I even start there? You know, going from you're bootstrapping your first duplexes with your wife. And I, I, I want to just uh, dive a little bit into that because that's interesting. So you, your boss at the time just said, here's a bunch of money, go nuts. Is that, was that essentially what happened? Yeah, well, it wasn't quite that extreme. But um, <laughs> like I said, we had, you know, the, 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 the idea of going to Japan fell apart. And so we were at loose ends and then we just kind of started, started like, what do we do next? And I don't, I don't remember whose idea it was. It was probably mine to find something we could renovate and then renovate it. And this was in a part of San Francisco that was, I mean, it's come a long way. It's now called Hayes Valley, and it's one of the most expensive neighborhoods in San Francisco. But at that time, it was still very transitional. And uh, we bought this duplex for $132,000 with 10% down. The seller carried a note for 10%. We got a new first loan. My parents co-signed on the loan. Laurie's parents helped us with the down payment. And we started and literally worked our day jobs and then came home at night and worked on the property. You know, we paid tradesmen as we could and we hit it right. You know, we, we found something where the neighborhood really was improving and we were able to improve the property. And within, within about two years, we sold that and then uh, did a 1031 exchange into a bigger, much bigger three unit property around the corner in the same neighborhood and did the whole thing over again. And uh, we owned that property for 26 years. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. That's yep. incredible. We converted it into condominiums. We bought the property for three big units, very, very big units. We bought the property for 420 grand. 
right away through about another 150 into renovating it and then just renovated it more as time went by and we eventually converted it into condominiums. And my wife and I had the top two floors and we sold that for almost two and a half million dollars. Wow. So, you know, even I can do math like that. I think, I think you make, you might make a little bit of money when you just, buy just it for 420,000 bucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I'm just pivoting a little bit into the growth of Hamilton Zance. What's been, looking back in 2001, so we're going on 20 years of the company, what's been the biggest lesson you've learnt growing oh, to 20,000 um, units? Well, and, and I, I, that's a really great question, but I would say invest in great people. I mean, if I could only pick one thing, I would say invest in great people, seek out really promising I will say young adults. I mean, we don't discriminate against anybody who's, you know, one age or another, but we've had a lot of success by investing in people who are early in their careers. A number of our most, most important staff have started as interns or trainees or, you know, analysts. They've started in one beginning position or another. And, and many of those people have stayed with us for 10, 12, 15, 18 years and, and risen through the ranks. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just really important to have, to have the opportunity to work with like-minded people, people who are really passionate about the work. And then, you know, you got to take care of them, right? You got to take care of those that take care of you. And, you know, if you maintain a good culture and you help people move up the ladder, right? And you, and you make sure that you create a ladder that they can move up and open the doors to participation in revenue and the, and the, the equity in the properties, you're going to have a pretty good chance. Yep. And I had the benefit for those listeners out there of actually interviewing Mark's CFO, Ashley Cabell. And she was, yeah. she was explaining to me how she started as an intern like yourself back in the day and worked her way up to CFO, which was pretty incredible. And it's, it's in one of the previous episodes. But I do want to go into one, something you mentioned earlier, which I thought was quite interesting from where we are today in today's market is you mentioned overpriced and trying to go into new markets when things become too expensive because you originally left San Francisco because stuff was just getting too out of control. Where are you seeing more affordable stuff today, particularly multifamily space? Because, you know, you look across any secondary market, it is going bonkers, you know, three, 4% yeah. like cap rates. Yeah. Like, so what are you doing to, to stay ahead of that? And where, where are you trying to look? You don't have to tell me all the secrets of your source, but sure. you know, where, where are you going? That's a great question. And there are no bargains right now, right? I mean, there just, there aren't. We worked, let me think, 2018, uh, when interest rates started to go up, curiously, there was, a, there was a massive surge of buyer demand, of capital demand for apartments. And that was, that was a year that we worked harder to find deals that year than we ever had. And, and curiously, it, it came as interest rates were going up, which to me seemed a little counterintuitive, but probably... Capital wanted to tie up debt while debt was still cheap. And capital looked at the prospect of rising interest rates as being a response to, you know, surging economic activity. And so that was a really hard year. We ended up probably, I mean, over the last three or four years, we've bought properties in, in Oregon, uh, Las Vegas, Colorado. We've also bought on both sides of uh, Kansas City, the Kansas side and the Missouri side. We bought in St. Louis. We have bought in uh, a number of different markets uh, in Tennessee, mostly around Nashville. Uh, we're buying our first asset in Charlotte, Virginia. We bought about eight properties in, excuse me, in Charlotte, North Carolina. We bought about eight properties in Virginia and we bought a few in Maryland and Connecticut. So we, we kind of went just where, wherever we could, right? Mm -hmm. Wherever we found pricing. Uh, that made sense and and some opportunity for cash flow. But what I would say is this, and, and this is maybe an, another thing that I've learned along the way, buying cheap isn't necessarily the guarantee of success. You know, you can buy stuff that's cheap that it's just going to, it's going to stay exactly as it is no matter what. And I mean, we, we, we were, we had, uh, at times we refer to it as commodity housing when there's no compelling reason to live in a place. And the, the main benefit that a resident is going to get is going to be cheap rent. That, that may not really be the basis for a successful um, investment plan. And what we found uh, looking back is that innovation centers, places where there's a lot of innovation going on, are going to be where you have the kind of economic activity that, that will support successful apartment investment. And I would just say, 
you know, if you look at the Puget Sound, it became, a, you know, it went from being logging and, and shipping and fishing to being tech, right? Oregon, some of the same stuff. So the Bay Area certainly is an exemplar of the value of innovation and technology. But that's also been true in, in Arizona. I think our number one market over the years has been the I-25 corridor in, in Colorado. And, it, and it's just because of the kind of jobs that are going there. And so if there, if there are high wage jobs going there, if people who are going to drive those economies, those business economies, and those real estate economies are going to be happy there, there's going to be amenities that they like, there's going to be good transportation, there's going to be quality of life, that's a sign. And you need to take that very seriously because a lot of the biggest decisions that are getting made in the business world are about where can they locate uh, facilities and job centers where people who can work in innovation are going to want to work. Austin, Texas is a prime example. You know, Austin, Texas is probably drawing more technology investment right now than the Bay Area. Colorado, again, a lot of jobs are going there. Atlanta, a lot of jobs are going there. And they go there, that, you know, Microsoft or Amazon or whoever goes there because they think that they're going to be able to build the workforces that they want in those places. And so, I mean, I, that's what I would say is follow innovation, you know, follow places where there's a lot of science, technology, engineering, math jobs. They call those STEM jobs. That's where you're going to get your best rewards. And then I also think historically, we tend to look at places maybe perhaps by default, where, where home prices are high. Mm -hmm. um, and where home prices are high, again, that's a function of wages in that area being high. But where home prices are high, it's going to make it a little bit more likely that someone's going to live in an apartment for a while um, before they go out and buy their first home. So, I mean, that's, that's what I would say. Uh, you know, look at places where they're growing jobs. How do you then couple the returns? Because particularly you say, like, I'm, I'm an active investor in Austin, Texas when you, you have such a transition over the last 20 years in that particular city to say a coastal market type of cap rate and the supply demand issue where you've got a lot of demand, but the supply is hard because, you know, the municipality makes it a little bit difficult to, to get construction out of the ground. So how do you try and still create that yield that everyone's chasing, particularly in this environment as we're on today? An old adage in this business, you've probably heard it, that you make your money on the buy, right? And, right. um, we bought a property in Colorado Springs, gosh, probably 15 years ago or more. It was brand new and it was beautiful, beautiful real estate. And it's the kind of thing that we would not have thought we could get ordinarily because, you know, the, the better the real estate, the higher the price, the lower the returns. Um, and, and people tend to pay more for what I would call pride of ownership or jewel box properties, right? They'll accept lower returns. And when I say the prices are high, I might really be saying the returns are too low. Um, but we bought this property. We got into the finals of the buyer pool because the, the owners who had built it, which were a California group, decided it was built to condo specifications. And they decided like almost at the last minute that they didn't want the exposure for condominium defect litigation. Yep. So they were only going to sell it to somebody who would put in a covenant that there wouldn't be a condo conversion. And so that knocked the other condo, that, that knocked the condo converters out of the box and we got the deal. And again, it was better real estate than, than we would ordinarily have got. We loved it. We did very well with it. I think we probably started paying out paying a five or six percent cash on cash. But the, that economy, uh, the Colorado Springs economy, really strong. A lot of technology, uh, a lot of defense installations, higher education, hard to build there. After 10 years of rising income, we were able to basically uh, refinance the property and return all the investor capital and still own it. And the investors are still the majority owners in it. And it turned out really well. And so, you know, you just got to, you have to be able to look, you got to have a little bit of a crystal ball. You have to be able to look forward and make, you know, you have to be careful with forecasting, but you have to be able to anticipate that certain things are going to happen. In recent years, we've really found that the, Paying a high price is, is, is got negatives and positives. One of the negatives is that if it makes your distributions low, then that's a problem. On the other hand, what we found is that the properties that are the better properties with the higher income households and the like, it's easier to model expenses on a forward going basis, and it's easier to model income movement 
forward going basis. Whereas when you buy the older stuff, stuff, it's maybe a little ragged. It's got a different, different demographic. It, it's harder to, to anticipate uh, what you're going to have in terms of major maintenance and repair uh, projects on systems, lighting, underground, electrical, water, sewer, you know, the whole nine yards. That, that stuff breaks. It, it, it wears out over time. And, and what we found was that uh, by, buying, by buying newer stuff that was larger scale and, and more what we would call core plus rather than value add, was that by purchasing the core plus stuff, and being really meticulous about it, we were also able to do very well and actually probably have more upside over time in the amount of income that we are going to be able to distribute to investors. Gotcha. So it's, uh, you know, you do make your money on the buy. And, you know, if you see something that just that you see an opportunity aspect to something and you see how you're going to uh, be successful over time, you got to trust your judgment. Mm-hmm. Looking forward back to the crystal ball analogy, because a lot of people that I talk to, it's very much in Austin because Austin is blowing up, but they compare it too much to coastal cities. Like, okay, here in Los Angeles, here in San Francisco, you're paying 250 to 300K a door for a 1980s asset in, a, you know, in mid-city Los Angeles, right? People then say, well, you know, the rent for that for, for one bedroom is 2100 bucks, and that's for on the low end. So thus, Austin or these interior cities like Colorado's have a long way to go to get to that price per pound and the rent. Do you buy into any of that? I don't want to say it's a myth that coastal, coastal cities or gateway cities are, are myths. There's certainly a lot of institutional investors, whether it's pension funds or REITs or, or sovereign funds, that want to invest in Seattle. They want to invest in La Jolla. They want to invest in Palo Alto. They want to invest in Miami. They want to invest in Washington, D.C. But I do think that, that a lot of these places that are not coastal, Austin, for example, Atlanta, for example, even Kansas City, you're getting a lot of the drivers. Um, and, and let's face it, the drivers are people, right? The drivers are people who, who have good jobs and want to live in certain places. And they're the drivers. And a lot of those drivers are going places like that. They're going to, they're going to Detroit. They're going to Spokane. They're going to Cleveland. There's a famous, justifiably famous real estate economist whose name is Peter Lineman, and he, uh, he was a professor at Wharton uh, for many, many years. But he's, he's probably one of the two or three premier uh, real estate economists uh, in the United States. And for his, he, he listed five cities that he thought were going to have um, the most upswing in NOI for apartment owners coming out of the pandemic. Maybe I'm repeating myself. I can only remember four of them. But one of them was Orange County. One of them was the Empire, Inland Empire in, in Southern California, which is Riverside and San Bernardino counties. Um, you know, R- Riverside, uh, you know, obviously, uh, he, he thinks it's a strong place. If you have a choice to go to La Jolla or Palo Alto or Bellevue, Washington or Riverside, most people are not going to choose Riverside. Right, but he was looking at the economics of it. The other two were Detroit and Cleveland, right? And I, for some reason, I've forgotten the fifth one. But, you know, he, see, he, he sees a lot of household formation going in there. And he also looks at, um, at new construction, at deliveries. He, he, he always comes back to supply and demand. And um, he, he, felt that he, he seems to feel that the supply and demand economics are going to be, that those are, the, that those are four of the top five where you want to go. And so, you know, on these coastal cities, whether it's uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Santa Monica, capital, so much capital wants to go to those places that the returns get pressed down. And we have to follow returns. We have to be the master that we serve first and last is returns. We also want to buy real estate that we're going to like, um, but, but it has to cash flow. And we've, we've uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've probably owned 20 properties in the Metropolitan Puget Sound um, over the last 15 years. We've never bought a single property in King County. Seattle, right? We've never bought a single property in King County. We've never bought in La Jolla. We've never bought in, in Orange County. Uh, you know, in our early years, we did a lot of work in San Francisco and, and Oakland. The impetus uh, for us to, to go elsewhere was that when we had made money, um, where we had executed business plans and, and had successful outcomes, uh, with our investors and we're getting ready to sell it and we're going to do a 1031 exchange with new capital. 
in order to stay in these markets, in order to stay in San Francisco and Oakland, we're going to have to, to face ever lower returns. And uh, we, we like being able to forecast cash flow that, that, that's above what people can get through other means. And if we have to go to our investors and say, well, we're going we're gonna to put up 50%, right? We're, we're going to get a loan for 50% and we're going to distribute 2%. Nobody's going to be interested in that. Right. You know, we tend to be what I would call an intermediate leverage shop. We're going to, we're going to leverage 65 to 70%, but we want to be able to, we want to be able to make a, a distribution that's compelling. And, you know, and as prices go up in Seattle or Santa Monica or La Jolla or Palo Alto, uh, returns get compressed and you just have to put a lot of capital in to get a very small to get a very small uh, distribution. And you have to hope that just because you bought it in one of these places that someday it's gonna be worth more. Right. And that's, you know, we decided a long time ago that that was a tricky thesis and we really wanna see, we wanna see the underwriting, we wanna see the facts on the ground for the return. And so we've gone elsewhere. And, you know, you started with an innocent, innocent question about gateway cities and I, I took you through the woods <laughs> on that. But um, I, I think that um, in a way, Boston is a gateway city. Right. It's an international city. People are going there. People are flooding there like it might, you know, might as well be Miami. Right. Um, that's a gateway of sorts. It may not be uh, a gateway for shipping, um, but that's a gateway. And if you're not sure if it's a gateway, look at the cap rate. If the cap rate's really low, you're probably looking at a gateway city. <laughs> and then you've got to be careful about finding your returns if the cap rate's really low. So are you actively not looking in places that have started to compress like an Austin or Denver or the like where they're starting to really, really become quite compressed? But I know that it's tight correlated to interest rates, but what cities are you looking at to try and chase that yield because of this low cap rate environment that we, we see ourselves in? So what I would say is this, I, I wouldn't say that we've isolated certain markets that we're not going to look in anymore. We, we look in all the markets. We're in, we're in the Puget Sound. We're in metropolitan Portland. You know, we haven't bought an apartment property, a multifamily property in California in almost 20 years, probably mm. 17 years. Um, so we're not really looking. We're not looking in our home state uh, just because of pricing, right? But other than that, we'll look anywhere. Um, and brokers that know us and know what we're looking for We'll take every single one of those calls if it's in a market where we are um, and, you know, we like all the markets that we're in and we'll go, we'll go to any of those markets if the deal, if the opportunity underwrites. Uh, what I would tell you is that some markets are really hard right now. Like, like for example, we can't, we can't get into to Phoenix uh, to save our life because the prices are so high and the returns are so low. Um, but what I would say is that where we are still hoping to find uh, deal flow would be in uh, Georgia, in uh, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Tennessee. We do have properties in Connecticut. I don't know. I, I just don't know that we'll see more opportunities in Connecticut. But right now, it seems like we think the, the Midwest and uh, uh, and the mid Atlantic are 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 going to be the most fruitful for us, um, and so we're probably doubling down on our searches in those markets right now. We would also look in Florida, but we probably wouldn't. We probably wouldn't look in Miami or Fort Lauderdale again, just because of pricing. We've chased opportunities in Tampa and never come away the winner. But you know, we would also look in Charleston, South Carolina. So again, I would say the Southeast, the mid Atlantic, and, and parts of the Midwest. Are, are where we're really hoping to find more transaction flow. I love it. I love it. Well, look, as we come to the end of the show, I want to ask you where you see Hamilton Zance in, in your future, both you know, professionally and personally, in the next couple of years? Let's say, say next, next five to 10 years. That's a really good question. Uh, we're building it to last. And, and, you know, that comes back to one of the first things we talked about is, is having great people in your shop. And we're building it to be, be eventually be so that, that Tony and I and, and Kurt Hal Cooper, who's our, who's our third partner, he's younger than we are. And he joined, he joined after we started the company. We all want to be, we all want to be able to retire. I used to think I would die with my boots on and I've grown up a little bit since thinking that way. And I do think that retirement has a place in my life, but we hope to be uh, succeeded in the organization by, by the great staff that we have. And, you know, we've been able to build a little bit of a diversified business because we also have 
uh, we're vertically integrated with our management company, which is called Mission Rock Residential. And then we have a, a commercial arm, uh, Graham Street uh, Realty, which does a little bit of urban office, more suburban office, and a little bit of uh, light industrial reflex. And so we, we, we also acquire that kind of property through Graham Street Realty, which is a, a sister company. And then we have a, a, a commercial management company, which, which, which oversees our commercial investments, but also does third-party business. Mission Rock oversees our apartment business, but also does third-party business. So we want these, these, these companies to continue to grow and thrive, and we want people to rise up through the ranks and really get a place at the table in terms of where the economic participation happens. I mean, I've been telling myself that I'm going to work another 10 years. Uh, we'll see. Um, it's, <laughs> certainly, it's certainly possible. Uh, my wife and I both think that I've got another 10 years in me, and she probably enjoys having me out of the house at some, <laughs> at some point. Today. We hope that every year uh, just gets better and stronger and that we have a stronger organization and that by the time, you know, by the time uh, the old guys retire, that there's a very strong organization behind that's going to have yeah, you know, if I if I last another ten years, I hope that twenty years from now they say the best ten years have been the last ten. You know, I uh, I want the life of the business to get better every year, whether I'm in it or not. And and I think that's what all the partners, what the three primary partners are are aiming for. That's awesome. I, I think that's an incredible vision to have for for such a company that's been created from nothing. At the end of every show, we do a quick lightning round, which is five lightning questions. Uh, you ready to jump into it? Go ahead. Mate, what is the habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals every single day? I spread out all of my um, tasks and deliverables. I sometimes refer to them as my make good. The little things, the little loose ends that I need to tie off, my to-dos, I spread them all out on a table and I put them in a calendar. And I try to knock off as many of those as I can every single day. That's awesome. I love it. Big, big to do, man. Question number two, who is the most influential person in your career to date? Truly, um, there, there'd be a few good candidates. All of them have, you know, uh, uh, sprinkled pixie dust on me at, at different times in different ways. But I would say Jacob Levy. And, and Jacob Levy was the uh, gentleman who early on saw the opportunity to make money by renovating little buildings in San Francisco. And he didn't blink. He didn't flinch. He just said, go do it. And I got to do my day job uh, while I was doing that. And I got to go running around town looking at stuff to buy. And it, uh, that was a real breakthrough. And, you know, my wife and I ended up spinning up a little, uh, a, a little enterprise out of that that led to the next enterprise and so on until, until Tony and I hooked up. Yeah, I would say Jacob leaving. That's awesome. Right. You, yeah, without him, I don't think you'd be here today, right? <laughs> Question number three, what is the most influential tool in your business? When I say tool, it could be a physical tool like a phone or an iPad, or it could be a piece of software that you cannot run the business without. What is it? Anything that facilitates communication. Uh, back in the day, I would have said a telephone. Then there would have been the coming time I would have said email or text messages. Uh, certainly now you and I are, are conversing on this thing called Zoom, which mm -hmm. you know, who, knew about, who knew about this two years ago. So I'd say anything that facilitates communication and allows you, it, it allows anyone to have a meaningful piece of dialogue, you know, real dialogue, a real exchange of thought and discussion about interests and perspective is far and away the most important tool. That's awesome. And second last question is, what has been the biggest failure in your career? One, in one sentence, what has been that biggest failure in your career? What did you learn from that failure? We do a lot of business with, you're not going to get one sentence out of me, but you can keep trying. <laughs> we do a lot of business. Most of our business is with, institute, with, is with individual investors, but we also do business with institutional investors. And we did, a, uh, we did an institutional joint venture with, with Wachovia back in the day, back in the, the late 2000s. And we put five-year money on it. When those loans came due, nobody was getting loans, right? It was, the, it was the deleveraging era. At that point in time, Wells Fargo had taken over Wachovia and become, uh, and become our joint venture partner. And uh, Wells Fargo was not going to deleverage the loans, right? And so we were going to have to come up with some very large checks. Uh, Wells Fargo said, we love you. You've done a great job. We really respect you. We want to do business with you going forward. And we like you so much. We'll give you each one of these two properties for $1 each, right? All, that's all. Sale for you. But the problem was we were going to have to come up with like 25 million bucks to deleverage the loans. And it just wasn't going to happen. 
And so um, Tony and Kurt and myself were the, were the biggest investors that were not Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo just said, guys, game's over, but let's check out. And so we had to make an orderly surrender of the property to the, to the loan servicer. We went about it in a good enough way that Wells Fargo has probably continues to be our number one, uh, has, has probably been our number one lender since that time. We, we do business with others. And the lender that took it back in servicing ended up doing business with us also. And so, you know, we just had to accept the pain. It didn't make anybody feel good, but that was, that was, where, we, that was where we landed. And, and we got into that position because we didn't take out long-term debt. Mm. Mm. Long-term debt is the key. I can imagine that right now in terms of some of the deals that I wish I'd got long-term debt on, but uh, not, not to be. And mate, last question is where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to find out a little bit more about what you do at Hamels and Zants. Where do they go? They can just go ahead and email me. Uh, my email address is mark, M-A-R-K, at Hamilton, H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N, Z as in zebra, A-N as in Nancy, Z as in zebra, E as in edward.com, mark at hamiltonzans.com. And if you're, if you're having trouble falling, if, if any of your listeners are having trouble falling asleep at night, they can go to the website. The website's pretty good. The website tells our story pretty well. It's straightforward. It's easy to look at. And, you know, it might make somebody curious about business or about our shop. Oh, well, mate, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show, which I think is really, really key for, for, for taking the tidbits out of what you have grown over the last couple of years is always trying to understand where the value is in the, in the deal. So understand that you can chase the return. You've got to chase the returns because that's your number one your metric, you've got to give those returns to those investors, but also understanding where those, where you're going to find that and who's going to support that. And as you're saying, there's sometimes yeah. it's just commodity housing that can be, be nothing and you can't really push those rents or you can't really create those, you know, foreseeable, you know, capital expenditure items or OPEC, OPEX items. But, but if you invest in the right areas with high job growth, with high incomes, with high, high single family housing, you can have a good bet that your deal is going to do just fine over the long term. And I think that was probably the, the number one thing that I took out of, out of today's show. Did I leave anything out? No. And, and in fact, just to paraphrase what you just said, you know, y- your job is not to buy cheap. Your job is to buy well. And it, it's hard work. You will, look, you will look at countless opportunities uh, and you may grow weary of it. Uh, but it's hard work um, and looking for, looking for opportunities to invest well rather than buy cheap or just buy pretty. You know, we could all own real estate in Fifth Ave- on Fifth Avenue in New York, but none of us would make any money. So um, yeah, th- your job is to invest well. Yep. Yep. Love it. Well, look, mate, thank you so much for jumping on the show today. Enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch up very, very soon. Yeah. It'd be great to talk again, Reed. I, I enjoyed it and I, I'm honored to have been your guest and I look forward to, to talking again. But thank you, mate. Thanks again for coming on the show. That was great. So um, I really hope you, uh, you enjoyed it and uh, Hope one time I'm in San Francisco, we can I can take you out for a drink sometime. <laughs>